Andrew Cox from The Foves. Welcome to Australian Musician. Thank you, Greg. Nice to be here. Yeah, you've got a new album, Tropical Strength, out today. Um, how do you personally feel it stacks up against the, the band's other work? Oh, I'm really happy with it. Um, Mel, I probably would say that with a brand new album. You're always excited about it. But um, I think we've, you know, managed to sort of stay pretty consistent with our the quality of our output um, over the journey. So, um, yeah, I feel I, I'm still really happy with it and um, see how I feel sort of after the end of a tour and playing the songs and stuff. But yeah. uh, at the moment, yeah, really happy. Yeah. Do, do you expect the, the tunes to develop over time the more you play them? Um, oh, I mean, they, yeah, they, they develop. They'll, I mean, we recorded them fairly unrehearsed. So um, they were pretty much, we learned how to play them and bang, went to record them. So that, that probably leaves a bit of room, I guess, for um, development over time. Um, you always find things, you know, you pick up things, drop off things when you play them live. Yeah. Um, but these songs are fairly, uh, they're reasonably stripped back anyway. So um, often we've found, I suppose, with songs in the past, they might have had a bit more studio instrumentation and they sound a bit different live because you um, don't have that there. But I think these songs will set, stay fairly true to the to the recorded product just because it's pretty much just bass, drums and guitar on, on most of the songs. Yeah. Well, where did you record and over what period of time? Uh, we recorded in Bali. Um, yeah, yeah. So we just had this stupid idea that it was be, be good to go somewhere else and um, just, yeah, to take a different approach to the recording this time. We found this little studio on the outskirts of Denpasar, which was just super cheap. Um, and so it was a bit of a gamble because we didn't know, if it, you know, beyond the sort of photos we saw on the website, you know, was everything going to work, et cetera, et cetera. But, um, we got there and it was great. So we just did a, we just did seven days recording, um, very civilized sort of hours, and um, got it all pretty much oh ninety five percent of it down. We we finished it, a few vocals off back back home in Australia. But um, yeah, so it was just fantastic to do something different, and um, yeah, it sort of felt like the, the kind of a good move for us at you know album thirteen. It was yeah. Just uh, a, a time to do something a bit different. Uh, so it was self-produced? Yeah, yeah, yep. Yeah. Just just the four of us, um, which is how we've done it now for ages, really. I mean, the days of being able to afford a producer, um, as we sort of, you know, we'd work with other people back when we were um, on a on a big label, but but yeah, budgets don't extend to that anymore. So, but that's fine. We 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 just enjoy. We work so well together, and um, so yeah, that's that's kind of how we, we prefer to do it. Yeah, um, eleven tracks on the album. Were there more that you were playing around with? Yeah, I mean, we always write a lot of songs. We probably we probably had forty songs, I guess, all up. Um, and then it's just a pro. But these days, we don't learn them all. It's just too much work to learn forty songs when you're going to cull cull them down to kind of ten or eleven. So. We just do demos and then just basically have a fairly democratic process of trying to sort through, you know, the songs. Gen always, people always have songs that they like that don't make it. But, um, you know, there's probably always a core of six or seven that everyone really agrees on and then the others, other ones we have to hash out. But, um, yeah, so we that's how we do it. We hear all the songs in sort of demo form and then just, agree on the ones we want to do and, and, and learn them from there because, um, yeah, I mean, the days of just endless rehearsing and, and learning a whole heap of songs that you're never going to play, sort of just not really into that anymore. So yeah. um, that's the process we use. Um, there's some very melodic songs in there, Only Wait Forever, It, it, kills, your, uh, it kills Your Worst Enemies, a, a couple of melodic songs that... I was uh, enjoying. Um, who were the songwriters that inspired you growing up? Yeah, well, I suppose I started out, it was real singer. When I first got into music, it was real singer-songwriter stuff. Bob Dylan, Neil Young were my two kind of uh, the, 
the two artists that I really when I first started playing guitar, I suppose they were my biggest influence. Then then more about the time that we were forming the band, it was more that kind of late eighties indie guitar stuff, REM and the Smiths were were really big influences on us when we, we first got going. So they were kind of the formative influences, I suppose, that um that yeah, right back that when we first started getting and I and I suppose the other really big one was Sonic Youth because um we took a lot of learnings, I suppose, from them in terms of using alternate tunings and um not being very proficient guitarists. We found that alter, alternate tunings were a great way to sort of expand the songwriting and expand our our, our sonic palette a bit. So um yeah, they'd be they're the sort of acts that come to mind, I think, when I had to think back all, all that all that time ago when we were first starting, yeah. Yeah. Um it's a great great track on the album called Guitar Village, dedicated to the great music story in Frankston. Um <laughs> How important uh, are bricks and mortar music stores uh, or how important were they uh, growing up in an age now where people buy so much stuff online? Yeah, no, great point, Greg. I mean, I suppose, I, I you know, I, plenty of people of our vintage would, would identify with the fact of, you know, being able to go into a music store and look at guitars, touch them, pick them up, play them, dream about one day being able to buy them. Um and growing up on the Mornington Peninsula here in Victoria, Guitar Village was our was our local store, and um, we were down there all the time. Yeah, and it was we bought my, most of the stuff we we use today. Still, probably we we we've, we bought at Guitar Village over the journey. Some of it's gone by the way; it's been stolen or sold off over over the years. But um, but yeah, they're great places for forming dreams. I think um, music stores like that where you can just go in and. Yeah, to see these amazing. You know, you see some things you think, well, I'll never be able to afford that. And um, but yeah, great great place for for aspiration, I suppose. And um, and you're right. Yeah, I mean, I know the last guitar I bought was online, and it's certainly not the same level of romance as um, you know, going down and and seeing this thing on the wall. You know, every time you go in, and then one day saving up enough money to get it, um, which was certainly how we. Yeah, as I say, we. Uh, equipped ourselves in it because when we started we had one electric guitar and one amp between the two of us so um whoever wasn't playing guitar kind of just had to dance um so yeah we fortunately moved beyond that phase pretty quickly uh, so what is your current uh stage setup what guitar and amp are you using uh i just use a um just mainly fenders i just got a a, a fender strat and a fender telecaster um phil has got a couple of he's got similar also a an old Rickenbacker he uses that he he did buy there, which is probably worth quite a bit now. And um, I think he bought it for yeah but before Rickenbacker's kind of got cool. So um, yeah, so there it's it's primarily Fenders that that we use. Um, and yeah, and Marshall amps always been Marshall amp guys. Yeah. Okay. Um, what about Peninsula venues? Uh, which ones have been important to the band? Well, it was funny because we there weren't when we started. I mean, we would play our very first gig was at the Mount Eliza Football Club, and then we we played various other halls and things around the peninsula. But there were there was no real um, original music scene on the peninsula. It was all it's always just been cover venues. So, um, you know, very quickly we would. Yeah, it was travelling up to the city if we wanted to to, to play in pubs. Um, the old Pier Hotel in Frankston, we did play one or two gigs there in the early days. Um, but, yeah, we played very, very few shows on the peninsula over the years just because uh, there's never really been much of an original music scene down here. Um, it, it, it's kind of a cover land. So, um, but, yeah, we, we there were, as I say, yeah, a few... You know, we played a few of the Peninsula board riders events down in various halls and things. Um, yeah, but not so much in pubs. Yeah. Um, the video for your single Un Australian is uh directed by yourself. Uh where did you get your filmmaking smarts from? I don't have any. None of none whatsoever. Um that was all just archival footage. That that particular clip was all taken from a a strange tour we did of the Northern Territory. Um 
probably 25 years ago on a, in a light plane. We went to um, Nullumboy, Catherine. Uh, we played the resort at Uluru. And, um, yeah, and I just happened to film it at the time on an old handy cam and then just dumped it onto a VCR tape and it sat in the cupboard for 25 years. And I thought it might be good, just out of interest to see what it looked like and um, obviously looks somewhat degraded having sat there all that time when I digitised it. But um, then I just thought, yeah, what a, a good way to make a very cheap and easy clip just to just to chop it all up. So, um, but that's as far as my uh, filmmaking skills extend, yeah, just a uh, bit of cheap software on the computer and um, ch cutting up old footage. Uh, is there anything about the, the music scene in the 90s that doesn't happen now that you miss? Well, I mean, it is very different. Obviously, it was pre-mobile phone, pre-internet, so that's changed everything. Um, for us, it was, you know, we we made a demo tape and it was a tape, a cassette tape, and we'd run off a bunch of copies and walk around Greater Melbourne on foot going into every pub that looked like it had a stage and asking to see the guy who, who booked the bands, you know. So it was very hands-on and... Um, you know, as I say, you know, you weren't emailing anyone or or caught, it was just, yeah, face to face. So, um, yeah, so, I mean, it's hard to compare, you know, obviously, I, you know, I, I don't imagine bands work that way these days, but look, there is a romance to it, definitely. I mean, um, a lot of hard work and a lot, a lot of grunt and a lot of, a lot of gigs in front of, a lot of Tuesday night gigs in front of absolutely no one, Um but it hardens you and inures you to the sort of slings and arrows, I suppose. And it's a big reason why 36 late years later, we're still going, because I think we really developed our resilience back then. You get a lot of knockbacks. Um, yeah, as I say, a lot of, a lot of shows that nobody comes to, um, just a lot of hard work. And um, yeah, which I, I think it, it, it's that, that, that sort of formative stuff that's um, yeah, kind of one of the big reasons why we're still going. Yeah. What are you looking forward to most about the Custard tour? Um, just, well, I mean, we've played a lot with Custard over the years. We've done a number of tours with them, so it'll be great. We're, I think we're a really great match as, as two bands, um, get along really well. So it'll be fun. We haven't played any shows at all this year, so, um, yeah, it'll be great, and you know, to have some new material and hopefully, you know, the audiences will sort of, get on board with it and um but yeah it's always great having having not played for a while just to get back out and hopefully we can still do it <laughs> so uh but yeah just all, all the fun of, of of touring i suppose and, and and it is fun it's just a chance to be just a just it just you just become teenagers again in a lot of ways you know um it's kind of a privilege to be a middle-aged man and but still in touch with uh a kind of dumb young side that playing kind of live rock brings out in you. Yeah. Uh, uh, Paul Medew from Custard told me that the Foves always led them astray. Uh, how much truth's in that? Oh, it probably goes a little a bit both ways. Paul's probably, <laughs> probably understating the uh, degrees to which Custard had the ability to lead people uh, astray as well. But, um, yeah, look, you, you get a bunch of, you know, young guys together with guitars and and a, and a and a and a bucket full of beers, and there's inevitably going to be some stupid behaviour going on. Um, so yeah, and we're all a lot older and supposedly wiser now, but I imagine there'll still be some, yeah, still be some stupid behaviour regardless. Yeah. So how are you approaching the set list? Uh, how many of the new songs will you rehearse up? Yeah, well, we'll probably rehearse four or five. I mean, it's a it's a big ask to get people to listen to much more than that in a in a set. I mean, um, you know, particularly as a record, it's only out today. Uh, so yeah, we're we're aware that you know, I mean, while people you know are, are generally polite when they hear new music, they still want to hear the stuff they know, and that's just that's just the way live music is. So. Yeah, we'll filter the songs in through the set while trying to, you know, remain entertaining and and give people some some touch points of music that they're more familiar with, um, rather than sort of you know come out with ten new songs. He's welcome to our new direction because it it just doesn't work. We've tried it before, believe me, and um, 
yeah, you 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 got to have those um those moments where people can get okay, I know this one. So yeah. yeah. So w- which of the new songs are you looking forward to playing? Um, just the ones we can manage, basically. I mean, they're still they're all still really fresh. So um probably you know, I guess probably the, the more up tempo ones on the record, uh kind of the naturally the ones that probably uh early days work better live, you know. Um it's probably more more of a it's a tougher sell to get people to listen to kind of more mid paced or slower mellower songs that they don't know. But um yeah, so on Australians is one that we've been rehearsing, which I think will probably work pretty well live. It's got kind of a dynamic that that will sort of um kind of yeah I, th- I think that should really rock pretty hard hopefully so um yeah but it's it's just yeah just at that process of because we recorded it a, the re- record a year ago so it's just also been just what you know just which songs do we remember the best and sound best so um we're still sort of sorting through that with a week to go to the to the starting the tour yeah. <clears throat> how do you reckon the foes would go if you were starting up today yeah, I don't know. It's um, it's just such a yeah. As we were sort of alluding to earlier, it's just such a different landscape. Um, you know, I think we, I think we were really helped by the fact that when we started, I mean, we were just we just had no idea how to be in a band, barely how to play our instruments, and there was probably a lot more room to develop back then. You could kind of hone your craft over a, a longer period, whereas I think now you have to come into the marketplace. A lot more well formed as just not that tolerance to you know probably follow a band through its its phases as it as it grows you know you kind of have to hit the ground running and and get people into you otherwise you're just gone there's just so much out there and so many other things for people to get into so i think we might struggle because we've always been we've always had a lot of raggedy edges and um as i say back in that time there's probably more tolerance for that, I think, than perhaps there is now. Yeah. Um, so the new album, Tropical Strength, is out today. Uh, then there's the the tour. Um, what does the future hold for the Foves after that? Uh, look, we'll probably probably look to do a few headline shows early next year. And then I didn't think about making another record. It was too long a gap between this one and our previous one. Like, I've oh, been COVID obviously fell in the middle of that, which kind of waylaid us a little bit or significantly. Because we had did have plans to record a lot earlier, but um, yeah, making records is still the thing we probably love the most, and it's still the kind of thing that for a band of our vintage, if you're not doing it, you kind of yeah, you kind of need to do it. I think just to to stay alive, you know, and to stay stay relevant on some level, or at least relevant to ourselves and to our very small audience. So um, yeah, I think we'll, we'll try and make another record in 2025, and but beyond that, you know, it's yeah, I mean, it, it's a very we're a very much a cottage kind of uh, cottage organisation these days. So um, anything good that happens is kind of unexpected and a bonus. But yeah, we'll just keep plowing away, doing our doing our thing. I think. Yeah. Well, Coxie, it's been great to chat, and uh, the album's great, and uh, look forward to seeing uh, how you treat these songs live. Oh, thanks, Greg. Appreciate it. Thanks for your time.